All right, it's a few minutes after 7.30. I think we'll get going. Thank you all for coming this morning. It's my sincere pleasure and honor today to introduce Dr. Alex Darden as our Grand Round speaker. She's visiting us from Oklahoma. Uh, she's a good friend of her own, Dr. Terry Stull, who unfortunately can't be here today, but um, is with us in spirit. Uh, her career has been impressive and varied. She grew up in New York um, and obtained her undergrad undergraduate degree in biology uh, in Brooklyn. She then completed a PhD in immunology at UT Southwestern and then had a long and successful career as a basic science researcher in South Carolina. Subsequently, she changed her focus to faculty development and medical education research um, and completed a master's of education in curriculum and evaluation at the University of Cincinnati, which we were talking about getting a degree after having other ones and later in life is always an interesting process. Um, she's currently a professor of research, director of the Academy of Teaching Scholars, and director of pediatric faculty development at the University of Oklahoma. And please help me extend a warm, no pun intended, Phoenix welcome uh, to Dr. Darden as she speaks to us today on the value of evidence-based teaching. Thank you for that warm introduction, Brig. Thank you, Micah, for facilitating this, and thanks to Dr. Terry Stoll in absentia for making this all possible and putting my name forward. So, I became very interested in how the brain learns when I started teaching at college level, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So I have, unfortunately, no commercial disclosures. I'd love to retire tomorrow, but darn, I have to work. This is my guiding mantra. I will get the same paycheck in general, whether my trainees, my students, whoever I'm interacting with learn or not, if I, quote, teach. But that's all teaching is all about me. The activity should all be about the people who are in the room. So for today, that's you. If I do my job well, if I send you an email in a month, you can tell me at least one thing that you still remember from my talk. Maybe in a year, you do too, and even better would be if you apply something. So that's always my goal. We're going to talk a little bit. This is evidence-based. I'm trained as a basic scientist. So I, I like data. That's how I run my life, data. And everyone always says, oh, that education stuff, it's all so soft. Well, it turns out, number one, it's not all so soft. It's just different. So sometimes you have to think differently. And there, is, there are a variety of fields that contribute to this, including cognitive neuroscience. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we understand about memory. We understand some things. It's constantly evolving. I would like you to identify two teaching techniques that will support retention. You will certainly learn things here today, but the retention is what you still have in your brain a month from now. So I would not argue that when I'm teaching, you're not learning, but it's retention that I'm really much more interested in, as are you. And then also, we'd like you to apply one concept, and I'll give you opportunities to do this. We will be using Poll Everywhere, so if you could take out your smart device, whatever that is right now, and just log in to Poll Everywhere right now, this is how you do it. Go into your text messaging, and in the two, instead of putting a phone number or name, you're going to type in 37607. And in the text box, it's going to be Alex Darden, it doesn't matter if it's caps or lowercase, 973. This will be on the slides as well. So if someone comes in late, you can point that out to them. And after you type those two things in, you hit return. Is it working? Did you get a message? Whew. OK. This, if you've got a handout, this information should be on the handout as well. So again, if someone comes in late, you can point that out to them. But it will be on each slide. Um, you all have a piece of paper as long as you have a handout. If not, get a piece of paper, because we're going to be testing your brain. And you need something to write with. Um, the iPhone won't work, because you probably cannot scribe fast enough. Well, maybe the younger generation can. I wouldn't be able to. So this all started with a story. I had a student. I taught at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a military format institution. It is not an official. It's not like West Point. It's just a military format. I had to wear a uniform when I was tenured full professor tenured faculty. I wore an Army uniform, although I have no Army affiliations. And the students wore uniforms. They marched to meals. Was, everything was safe. So it was very rigid, very military style. And so everybody always came in neat and tidy. I didn't have to worry about people looking like slobs. But then in genetics, as a biology major course in the second, in the second year, 
Andrew walked in. And Andrew was always just a little disheveled, which was surprising. Um, so Andrew took the first test and he failed. And he came up to me and he said, I know this stuff but he had a learning disability. And the Citadel is like a little microcosmos. You don't want to self-identify to things. There's under 2,000 students. So you can get picked on a little bit, just like any other group of a community. And so he did not want to self-identify as having a learning disability before the exam. But after the first exam, it was clear that he would need some sort of accommodations. So I said, look, I don't care what you have. Let's go to the Title IX person at our campus in that office and discuss what I need you to learn and she will discuss how I can help you learn that material and then we'll go forward from there. Well, it turned out, you know, I'm from New York City, I'm from Brooklyn and I can talk really fast when I want to and I hadn't really learned to moderate myself at that time. So he said, he said no offense, but he was very honest, I talked fast and then I did would flip down overheads. Doesn't matter, PowerPoint's the same, you know, it's two-dimensional. And I was talking about three-dimensional molecules. So when people talk about DNA or drugs interacting in the body, how many of you have molecules dancing in your head? Go ahead, raise your hands. Do you see things? No, it's more two-dimensional. So I was an experimenter, and I always had molecules dancing in my head. That was the way I could design experiments. Well, this is going to come over here. It's going to change the dimension. Well, it turned out Andrew couldn't do that. It's like, oh, about that. I didn't know that. So I said, OK, I've got to think about that. How can I help Andrew? He's probably not the only one in the classroom. They never are. And the next day, we were talking about DNA synthesis, and I came in with yarn. And I twisted it up really, really tight. And I had two students come up and open it. And they had to back twist it, because we had twisted it so tightly. They had to, in order to untie, open it. And I said, OK, so great, it's open. We can replicate. And I'd say, OK, sit down. They'd let go and it closed. I said, uh-oh, what happened? And so we worked through the process of DNA synthesis as much as we could with yarn to under help the students understand three-dimensionally what were the problems that the cell had to solve. Then we went two-dimensional, overlaid the big fancy words, and actually drew things. And the students loved it. They said, that was fabulous. I so understood what you were talking about. Can you do that all the time? Well, it's hard to come up with that stuff all the time because it's difficult just to, you know, how do I take the stuff I've been teaching very verbally and two-dimensionally and come up with those activities? And then, was it fun? If it's just fun, I don't give a rip. I don't care if my students have fun in my class, right? First thought, I want them to learn. So then I started thinking, and I got involved in um, some education programs, and I started thinking, can I design, can I understand learning well enough that I can actually design learning activities and predict what kind of learning will happen, occur because of that? So I was taking my scientific background and looking for evidence to support how I was teaching, just like I would in a science experiment or you do when you do evidence-based medicine. And then I wanted these activities to be hypothesis-driven. So I could say, if I do this in this class, it's going to facilitate this kind of learning. I also had to do it because I was the youngest faculty member and the first one to be hired in over 20 years, and I was the only female. And they started making fun of me, saying, oh, we don't play games in college classrooms, Alex. But then they started hearing the students talk about how well they were learning. They said, well, what are you doing? The students are talking about how they're understanding and they're able to do things so well. So I decided to approach my teaching the way I approach my science. The first thing I learned is this. So as you know with medicine, it's probably even worse for learning. If you have in your audience people who are sleep deprived, people who may be a little bit hungry, maybe they're a little dehydrated, maybe they have a lot of other things on their mind, how do we catch their attention? Emotionally, what's going on in the classroom? So it's not always as easy as you think, and everybody's brain, just like everybody's body, is different. So you have to keep this in mind, but there are some very basic things that we can do. So, this is your first poll everywhere question. What is the att average attention span? And by that I mean attention to the material being taught. 
in, of an adult learner in a lecture setting. So just click A, B, C, or D. Okay, it looks pretty stable, like the popcorn's finished popping. So the exact number really doesn't matter. What matters is that you have the concept that there is a limit to how long people's brains can focus on particular material. You are all very smart people, very successful. It is your job to pay attention. So some people think that, and believe 30 to 40 minutes is what that is. And for some people, that's probably it. Remember, every brain is different. The literature would support that it's 10 to 15 minutes is the correct answer. I would argue it depends. If you had just eaten a big full meal and had a glass of wine, I might go to the two to three minutes. That means that I have to be doing things to help you keep, a, I perceive that I need to keep your attention because it's wandering. If you are being paged constantly, it might be 30 seconds. If you didn't get much sleep last night, it might be four minutes before your brain starts to drift. You all know when your brain starts to drift. Go to a Grand Rounds where the topic is totally uninterest, uninteresting and you know nothing about it and you really don't care. And tell me how long, you, what your attention span is. Okay, so that's a great way to do it. I love taking classes and foreign topics totally off what I'm doing to remind myself what it means to be a novice learner and how difficult it can be. When you know a lot, it's a whole lot easier to keep adding and we'll talk about that. So I would say there is no hard, fast answer to this. But keep in mind that the attention span can be limited, and we will look back at this. I had that other slide in just in case. So evidence, we're gonna start looking at what some of the evidence is. And if you are interested in following up, I do have a reference slide. The evidence can be found in cognitive psychology, which is often not in PubMed, so I use psych info a lot. It can be found in the biological sciences, although most of the um, FRET, fMRIs are only very specific and do not attend to general or big general learning. It can be found in the education literature as well. So some of it is behavioral information and some of it is what we would consider more hard science. The hard science always confirms the, the behavioral. So don't put off what the behavioral stuff says from cognitive psychology and from education. So we're going to test your brain. Your next task is going, going to show you a list of 10 three-letter words in some language, not in English, and you're going to memorize them. You will have 10 to 12 seconds. So no writing yet, just look and memorize. Everyone ready? Oops, okay. Write down what you remember. Okay, grade yourself. Just put a check. So it has to be correctly spelled and in the right place in the sequence to get it right. Hey, I'm, I'm a demanding teacher. I'm setting the bar high for you. You're smart people. So how many people got everything right? Okay, sometimes there are people because people have photographic memories. How many people got, say, in the first three, got at least, got all of them right? Some of them right in the first three? Put your hands up high if in the first three you got at least one correct. Okay, so that's more, by eyeballing, that's more than 50%. How about the last three? How many people got one of the, at least one of the last three? Okay, that's about 25%. And how about the middle? How many got some of the middle right? Okay. Okay, that's usually what happens is in the first things you see first is what you remember best. And often at the end is also what you remember best. And the middle becomes a little bit iffier. So this is a very important concept. We just proved it very simply, or we just demonstrated it. It may not be a proof to you. 
but this holds out over any learning episode. So we just did a learning episode. I asked you in the space of maybe under a minute to learn 12, 10 three-letter somethings. Um, but we, the same thing has been shown if the time period is 40 minutes, 80 minutes, 20 minutes. We remember best what we learned first. So if you look at this graph, we call this prime time one. Within five minutes, people's attention is all focused, and there's excellent learning going on. This is good, and this is all the new information. Then starts a downtime, and this starts at around, a little around 20 minutes. Remember when we did the attention span question, we said that might be a time when people's attention starts flagging. If you got paged or other things, if your prime time could be shorter. Then you come to a downtime, and during this downtime, it's not that no learning occurs, it's just a lower level of learning. And then as we come to the end of the learning episode, and usually you know that because you're looking at watch, when is this going to be over? And so maybe you start paying a little bit better attention or someone starts saying what the conclusions are, and so your brain kind of kicks in again. And so you have a prime time two, which is lower than prime time one. Does that all make sense? And you've probably all experienced this, and you've heard you always remember best what you learned first and last in a lecture. So I would just say, what, if, when you're teaching, how would you apply this information to your teaching? You can just somebody shout out. What does this mean you should do when you're teaching? Teach, teach the most important information first. And what do we often do when we teach or give a, a lecture? We do a whole bunch of background stuff, right? So effective ways I've seen to do this is present a case. And immediately people's brains engage, and maybe you start talking about this case, and people say, okay, I get it. This is where we need to be looking at this. This is an important part of the history of physical. Then you go to the background. But the important information you wanted to get them is right there. Now the background information, if their brain is starting to drift, it may not be as important that they know it, or they can go back and look at it, and then you can come back to the end again. Um, and with the conclusion, you might say, now let's go back to the case and apply the information we were just talking about. Um, it may. I have not looked at that literature. Okay? Likely it does, but what I'm going to say applies very well no matter what audience you're working with. You may just want to change the time frames. So let's look at how this applies to memory. How long did you get to practice those first words in the list? You had the whole, almost the whole 12 seconds, right? Because you probably started at the top. Some people might have started at the bottom. But if you started at the top and went down you, and kept doing it that way, you kept seeing those first words. You rehearsed them multiple times. The last words you may have seen once or just twice. So you saw the first words a whole lot longer. So let's look at what that means in terms of different types of memory. In the environment, what I'm doing, I'm talking to you, you're looking at things, there's temperature, so you're taking in all kinds of information. If someone dropped something in the back of the room, you'd hear it, but as long as nobody said anything about that or drew any attention, that information would be lost very quickly. It would just go out, because your brain can only hold so many nuggets. So what's in here then will move to working memory, some of it, not all, a lot of it goes out, so this is where I want information. So in that word list, the first words work to move to working memory a whole lot quicker than the last words did. And then some of them may have gone to long-term memory. I would argue not that many, but you had more rehearsal. In like 15 minutes, all of those will probably be gone. They'll be out. So our goal is to try to move information from working memory to long-term memory, which increases retention. So your short-term memory has a limited capacity and we're going to measure yours and we usually hold stuff in there it comes and goes but it'll get full within 10 to 20 minutes which is part of the attention if your brain is full you just can't take more information out without chuck in without chucking stuff out so if we look at presentations if we look at learning episodes and we're coming to the end of my first learning episode so it should be about 20 minutes if we have a 20-minute learning episode, the downtime is shorter because I'll be making conclusions. I actually had you try to apply, well, I'll have you try to apply some information. In a 40-minute episode of an lecture, 
there'll be a longer downtime, and in 80 minutes, it's an even longer downtime. And so if we look at the numbers, you want to maximize prime time, and we'll talk about how to do that, so you don't have to ask that question yet, but in so that you have the maximum amount of time in prime time. So doing multiple learning episodes will work, and here's just, I'm reinforcing what you saw, we remember first. So here's some data from physics. This is 6,000 students, I think. These red bars represent traditional courses where someone lectured straight for 50 minutes, and they have some psychometrically sound concept inventories that they use to test students' retention. And in traditional lectures, straight lecture, no interactions, no lab than time students to work with material, the maximum learning was about retention was about 30%. Now, some of this might be crammed at the last minute, but this was the maximum. Once you create interactive sessions, and again, we'll, you've already had some interaction to engage you, the maximum learning goes up to 70%. They've never been able to get beyond that. And now the lowest learners down here are where the highest retention was earlier. So the mere act of adding some interactivity, giving someone an application question helps with retention. They probably learned it, but we now want retention. These are short breaks, 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, twice. So is it worth two minutes of your time to get better retention? So here's your long-term memory boost. I want you to think about what was just discussed and identify something that was an eye-opener for you. I want you to reinforce that by turning to your neighbor. If you're not sitting next to someone, find someone. Tell them what that was. Commit to what was an eye-opener. Does that sound like feedback? Okay, so this activity is called Think, Pair, Share. And if you, depending on your environment, you might ask for a couple of people. So I'm gonna ask this group of three ladies here, what was one thing that one person said that was an eye opener? Any one of you. You can talk for the group, it doesn't have to be yours. Just shout it out. Okay. So that's the share part. So I could quickly go around the room. I could collect that data in a variety of ways. I could have a slide up where I asked people what they thought it was and collect it that way. So that's think, pair, share. Was that painful? Pretty easy to do. So there's one technique. So what increases the probability that information will get into a person's brain and tends to stay there? And this is dependent on whether it makes sense and has meaning. So can the learner connect to prior information. So if you, they just did a study where they just changed the examples used in a biology classroom from examples that were relevant 40 years ago to examples that were relevant in today's world and the learning went up. Makes sense, doesn't it? The students could connect. The other way they learn things and they try to be, they were giving examples and the examples had no meaning or sense, may have no sense to the person, so they're like, oh, doesn't mean anything to me. And I said to you, think about other lectures you've been in, other grand rounds. I could have said something different, and you would say, what is she talking about? Makes, has no sense, I've never experienced that. So how do you connect to what already is in the mind, and does it have meaning for them? Is it relevant to what they need to know today, tomorrow, in a little bit? If you're, that's why medical students are hard to teach in the first two years, right? They say, what does this have to do with my clinical years? And we jam this information into them and it doesn't have meaning for them yet. So it's harder for them to retain that information. So again, that's what happened here in those one to two minute breaks. We gave the brain time to make meaning and sense of the material. Time to connect and time to say, why is this of value to me? And sometimes we just need to give them that little break, otherwise they're receiving so much they can't, their brain doesn't have time to do that. Using clickers can help with their think, pair, share. There's two techniques. Uh-oh. 
Yeah. Okay, so this can be a problem. You can tell people turn them over um, if you can. Sometimes I know we take these devices away from people. And this is published literature. You can look it up. Ever get to an intersection like this when you're lost? Where am I, which, which of these signs? So again, this is what your learners can experience. Um, I could have been giving you five or 10 different studies today, but I'm not, because I think I'd put you into this. And this is called cognitive load theory. So this is still an evolving theory, but we have a lot of data to look at this. So there are three types of cognitive load. The intrinsic is what I'm talking about today, is basically what we would consider the content. Extrinsic is anything irrelevant to the topic. And germane is the cognitive process. So when I asked you to remember, remember words, you were, that was you were using, working with your germane cognitive part of your brain. Oh, and this graph kind of shows all of that in it. That was a cognitively busy slide, wasn't it? Did it kind of put you in cognitive overload? What was goofy? Irrelevant. Yeah. Goofy didn't belong there at all. And if, you, if all you remember from this is don't put Goofy on your slides, I will be thrilled. How many times have you gone and people put these cool things? You know, then you sit there for the next 30 seconds. What does that have to do with the talk? And then in 30 seconds, they told you the most important thing. And you missed it because you were trying to figure out what that stupid thing was up there. And that stupid graph I put on, I didn't even talk about it. So it doesn't need to be there. It might be important in a different talk, but it doesn't matter for this talk, so get rid of it. This, on the other hand, is clean. You know what a measuring cup is. I assume you've all used a measuring cup. In a different society, this might not work because it doesn't make sense to you. You've never seen it, but it works in this society. You know a measuring cup can get full and overflow, so I'm telling you your brain can get full and overflow. And then I have the other information in there. So you can take this away with you. There's three things that go into it. I kind of remember Goofy. I kind of remember working my brain to answer the question. And then there was all that other stuff she told me. And at some point, she told me too much and my cup overfloweth. So this is, let's look at the cognitive load of working memory because it is limited. This is a multimedia presentation. So it, you're using your sensors, your ears, and your eyes to grab the information. I'm talking, there are words on the slides, and I'm showing you images. Now, when we talk and when you read, all words come in through the ear. It's auditory. That doesn't sound right, does it? Because you're looking at those words with your eyes. What happens is, and there's, I don't, it might be in that reference. I have other references for this. When we read, we actually read silently to ourselves and it comes in through the auditory channel. Which means that the reason you shouldn't read the slides is because it's cognitively distant. Right? If you read the slides, I talk a whole lot slower than you're reading. And if I read the words and you're trying to read the words, it goes stutter in your brain. You've experienced this. You know it's uncomfortable. Experiments show learning goes down. So please try not to read your slides. The other thing that's very important is that working memory takes sounds and images. And you could draw a line right here. Only so much of your brain can handle sounds, not the, all of it. And only so much of it handles images. Which means you can get a whole lot more information if you put both images and words on a slide. A picture is worth a thousand words, is truly the case. If your slides only have words, you're only making use of your trainees, your learners, of part of their working memory. And again, I, I ask of you, when you're in a talk, particularly one you're not particularly interested in, see what takes your, grabs your attention, what holds your attention, because then you will be testing the things I'm telling you. Don't just believe me because I have a doctorate. That's, I think you need to make this intrinsic. That's the way you will remember it. And then the, this gets integrated, the pictures and the words, um, the verbal mode, and it gets attached to your primary memory, prior knowledge, and goes into long-term memory. If all of that doesn't happen, it's gone. How do we prevent cognitive load? This is, you know, you've got to be very attentive to your trainees. 
you may be used to a busy clinical setting. If they're brand new, they're not. So every ding, bell, and whistle, they're like, what's that? Should I be paying attention? And they're not listening to what you might be telling them about a case. So you want to move them to an area where you know they're focused on you. Help them with that. Help them pay attention to what they should be paying attention when they should be paying attention. Less is more. We've already shown that on a slide. Um, so this is terrible. This is good. This is good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some tricks to help m more information fit. We're going to try to minimize cognitive load. So back to you. I want you to memorize this sequence of numbers. Okay, write it down. You can put a dash if you want to. You don't have to write everything. Okay. If you got all of these right, I want you to just write the number one down and circle it. We're going to call this a chunk of information because it's a sequence. You've seen it. You, when you're brand new, you would be learning them individually, but we're going to call this one chunk. So we're going, to, we're going to average these numbers. You ready for the next one? So I want you to memorize the entire sentence, starting with medical. give you a little longer because it's a harder. Okay, can you write down as much of that as you got? Okay, so how many, I want you to write down, put the number of words, entire words that you got right, spelled correctly, in the, and then just circle that number. So you probably get the feel already that some words you can learn as see, you've seen before, you get the whole word. The harder ones you kind of slow down and try to spell out and memorize each letter. Okay, that's this. Memorize this one in order or you're going to be asked to write it in order. Okay, write down as much as you can. Okay, check off, write, check off the numbers that you, ones you got correct in terms of both placement and the sh right shape. There are nine shapes. So write down that number and circle it. Now I want you to average those three numbers. And then based on your data, not anything you've read in the literature or thought about in the past, based on your number, where does your number fall? A is 3 to 5, B 8 to 10, C is 12 to 14. Okay, so this is a very crude scientific experiment, but I just wanted to help you understand as the information got more complex, it got harder to put the pictures together and to, mem to learn things, right? Um, the literature would, 
it, it always is, it depends, because it depends on the complexity of the information. People often think seven is the capacity of the working memory because of phone numbers, since seven is that, but that's very simple. As it got more complex, it got harder. So the literature does indicate three to five, but that, again, everything varies and it depends. So when we look at this, I'm going to chunk this information now. So this is a tic-tac-toe board taken apart. So this first one here is this shape. Oops. The second one is this shape. The third one is this shape, right? The fourth one, right? So this is a, this is a chunk of information that I took apart and put it down this way. So by chunking the information, you now have a lot more. If I say tic-tac-toe board, you now actually have a lot of information in your head about a tic-tac-toe board. In another culture, I probably couldn't use this slide because it has no meaning or sense to them. Like, I've never seen that before. So you can think about when you're talking about a disease, when you're talking about you go in and you do a history and physical and someone says, well, it looks like asthma. You say the word asthma, and as a learned person, all kinds of information floods into your brain. When the trainee starts, those are all particles of information. They have not yet chunked it. So I view my job as an educator is to help move the novice to the expert by helping them group information together correctly. And then I have file folders in my brain. So when you say the word asthma, I might go to the treatment folder because I'm thinking about treatment. When I say the word asthma, I go to what is the, how does this present in a baby? Well, babies probably don't have asthma. I don't know. I'm not a clinician. How does this present in a certain age? How does, what communities might I, right? So for asthma, you can segregate that information to so many different ways because you have a lot of information. So the chunk is asthma. So in one chunk, even if you can only hold four chunks of information in your brain for your working memory, the chunk called asthma actually has a lot of information. So anytime we can help students or trainees or learners for that matter, so when I take a course in German, I'm starting from scratch and I'm learning to do that kind of chunking. That is the difference. There's a whole literature on novice versus professional versus expert learning, and that's one of the things. Experts are facile at that. They have huge chunks of information. So you can look at chunking in two ways, and you can present it. I think of it as you can see the forest, and so you see the big picture, and then you know that within that pic big picture, there's all kinds of other stuff going on. Or you can look at all the discrete particles and build it and start putting it up. If you're looking at the insects, if you're looking at all the, the plants, the foliage, the animals, whatever. If you're looking at a whole ecosystem. So, I call it seeing the forest through the trees, seeing the trees through the forest. And you may be aware of this. When I taught undergraduate students, some people were big picture people, some people were the detail people. And it takes time to merge those two. Probably one is innate, and they tend to just think that way, but then they begin to pull them together so they can go in either direction over time. Usually you're just learning and you're chunking and learning more and putting it in. So those are the two views of chunking. So now it's your turn. We've just put a bunch more information into your brain. I want you to assimilate it. Describe how one concept we just discussed could be applied, and I'm reading my slide, I apologize, and discuss it with a neighbor. How might you take something and change your practice tomorrow? Commit. Pretend you're doing feedback.
Okay, this is great, some good conversation. Who wants to share for the group? This doesn't have to be your idea, it can be the group's idea, so no pressure. It, so we don't like it, we say he was his idea, right? So I like calling on people in groups because I don't tend, having worked with undergraduates made them really scared if I called on them one by one. But I often put them in groups specifically so that they would report for the group until we got to know each other, then we could go one at a time. So who want, would like to say something that was brought up in their group? Don't be shy. Come on. Thank you. Okay, so having presentations that have minimal number of slides. Li minimal amount of information on each slide and using examples. Okay, great. That's, that's a, that's, that is really, really good. Because really, a PowerPoint should not be for me. The PowerPoint should be to help the learner. I should already know this information. If I need notes, I should have them in front of me on note cards or use this note part of this. Reminder, not all PowerPoint presentation podiums have that, so don't depend on it, bring your own. Okay, there's nothing wrong with having notes to remind you to say everything, but it doesn't all need to be on the slide. And that's hard for us, that's really, now when I made this presentation first, every slide only had words and there were a lot of them. So I start that way because that's the way my brain thinks, and then I start taking away stuff. What's really needed, what's the major point of the slide, things like that. So that doesn't mean you can't start that way, you just don't want to end that way. So we, we have time, and there'll still be plenty of time for questions, to think about just some current trends. So there is definitely data that says less is more. It is so hard for us. We love to talk. We have so much knowledge in our head. But remember that beginning slide, it's not about me. It's about the learner. The learner should be doing more of the talking because that's how the information is integrated. So here is something, this is from Paul Hydette, talking, working with residents. And the conclusions of this study was 50% less time on teacher-driven content with the addition of having trainees work with the material, solve cases, talk to the, each other, had no impact in terms of a decrease in learning. So in this study, they didn't show that having, you know, like a 20 minute lecture and then having the trainees work, talk to each other and maybe solve some problems and discuss the information and apply it for 20, did not detract from their learning. It did not help particularly, but it certainly did not detract. Now other studies show it actually helps, so if you think that it would be bad for them to get less information, this study shows that's not the case. I know we always say I, they have to have the content, but in today's day and age, content can be looked up. Application cannot be looked up. That is so much harder. How do you apply? That's where they need you to help them, and that's where they need to practice. So you can give them feedback and say, it would be better to apply the information this way. Did you consider this? Just like the feedback you give on rounds, that same thing should be happening during didactics. didactics. So here's another one where the results of the study say when the density of material was low, the students actually did better. So they had three different groups, lectures on the same topic. High density was 90% new information. Medium, I'm sorry, I'm kind of reading the slide. I should have had that in my notes. But there was a medium density, which had less, and then low density was only half the information. But the extra time was spent doing some of the things we've been doing, giving people time to think about how would I use this, how would I apply this information. And the result was the students learned and retained more when they actually got less information but were provided the extra brain space to apply it. And what I often see now when I work with trainees is they'll get their phone out. And if they don't know something, because I didn't tell them, they look it up. So they can find the content, but then you might have to help them, was that a good site to go to? Are you thinking about this from the correct direction? Um, here we go, teaching techniques. This is from higher education. 
a large classroom, we saw this in the physics data, a large classroom which was purely lecture driven, no active learning, no time to apply the information, try to make sense and meaning of it. The learning and retention was lower. I'm sorry, the other way around. A small classroom that was strictly lecture, um, the retention was lower if there was not time to interact and play with the material. A large classroom that was interactive, even if it was 100, 150, 200, um, the, trainee, the learners learned more and retained it better. So size doesn't make the difference. I'm not saying it's easy to work with a group that large and put interactivity in, although we did think pair share, we did clicker questions. Um, there are some very, there's some very good information on, out on the web to look at it, but don't just think because of the size I can't do it. It's the teaching technique that is critical. And there are some really great papers that have been published in science, that, um, the, the journal Science, that reflect this. How many have heard of the flipped classroom? Okay, so the flipped classroom, the basis of the flipped classroom is people are supposed to learn a bunch of material outside the classroom and then come in and spend the time that normally someone might lecture um, just doing problems, applying it, talking to each other about it. That's the basis, and a lot of people put videos up for people to watch ahead of time. It could also be reading material. So somebody did a study looking at was it actually just, do you actually have to flip the whole classroom or could you do the equivalent of mini lectures and add in the interactivity? So in this class, this is the non-flipped approach, but they had um, active content during the class and after class. They continued to have them working and applying the information. And here in the flipped approach, they learn it first and then they come into class. So basically the same amount of time spent, just a matter of where they spent it. And this is my timer. And the basic bottom line was you don't have to have them, you don't have to flip the whole classroom. If you just give them assignments and interactivity and time to apply the information during class time and maybe some additional after class time activities, you'll get the same amount of retention. And the reason I say this is because creating a flipped classroom is very time intensive. Creating the videos, then creating all the activities. So you, if you want to do that, that's great. It's not a bad thing. But I'm saying doing just adding in a couple of cases that you ask people to, to discuss with each other, some clicker questions, is likely just as effective. So these are my conclusions. I always like to ask people what theirs are, but good CME practice, you have to have your conclusions. So just remember, we need time. It doesn't all just assimilate on its own. We have to think about how we're going to use it, how we're going to apply it. Please help your trainees have that. Give them brain space, the learners, whether they, they can be colleagues too. They can be your patients. I would advise that you think about some of this and talk, think about how you work with your patients. Their attention span, the parents are probably even shorter because they're under stress. So how, and they have to learn stuff to take care of their children. So how can you apply some of this information to helping them, and it may be that you give them something and say, what will this look like in, at home? Because your home setting is not the hospital setting. And have them tell you, because again, then they're committing, just like in feedback. They're committing to, when I am home, this is what I will do that meets this care criteria. I'm just bringing this back up, it's hard. This is why patients can have problems, because they're under stress, um, all of that feeling. I always begin and end with this slide. This is my mantra. Okay, so what is one, con my last one is a cloud. Um, what, type in a word, what is one concept you will apply to your teaching practice in the near future? Let's see if this works. Is anything, have people entered anything yet? Ah, okay. This is just kind of a fun thing to do in Poll Everywhere. The other thing is our, we're reinforcing, right? So you're now seeing what your colleagues are thinking. It's reinforcing the same words. Usually you have to rehearse things three to seven times before they really start sinking. This is cool. This is a lot of fun, actually, isn't it? Okay, great. I like that less is the big, biggest one out there. 
Um, just make the quality of what's less good so that you, that doesn't mean that you leave in 20 minutes, but you then help people learn. So I am open for questions. It is 823. I always have a little, we have that, what will you apply, but I think, what was the um, next to last shape? Someone draw it in the air. Very good, okay? So you may remember that a month from now too, right? I chunked, I helped you do it. So I always put this little quiz in. Here's my references, thank you very much. And we do have time for questions. I'm sorry, can you repeat? As we age. Okay. Well, the... Th right. The thought is that long-term memory is forever. So once something is put into long-term memory, you should be given the right trigger, you should be able to recall it. So you probably know there may be diseases that you've studied 10 years ago and you haven't seen and then one comes in and all of a sudden you trigger and say, wow, I haven't seen one of those in forever, I haven't even thought about it, but you're triggering. So it's the long-term memory is thought to be forever. You're right, the rest of it, things change with age, there is no question. But the basic things is still, if it makes sense to you and meaning, you say, I need to know this because you're much more likely to retain it. Um, you may have had more mental resilience in the beginning for rote memory, but rote memory just doesn't work very well. So I would argue that some of the time spans might be a little, and I have not researched this at all, but I think the same basics occur. We don't remember things unless we practice them. You ha rehearsal is important. You have to go over and over, which is likely why in that word list you remembered the first words better than the last. The first words you've rehearsed more times than the last. And as you saw time running out, you might have gone back to the last ones in the middle, just get lost. Um, so, yeah, age plays a role, but I don't think in terms of thinking this way, these very basic concepts, I would say, apply across the board. Just get people to repeat it, get them to practice using it. And it may, you may have to practice more frequently if your memory is going, but that's part of how it goes. I think the Socratic method is great. I don't know that you have to have this. Because, um, I think PowerPoint is a bane, personally, but that's what you gave me to work with. Um, but if you're asking questions, then you're asking people to make sense and meaning of things. And if you're doing it in a clinic area, then, or at a bedside, then there's actually visuals right in front of you, or they can bring the visual up of the patient in the room, and you might have it. Are you thinking about it in that context? Or are you thinking about sitting out on the grass and chatting? Yeah, I think that's great because that again makes sense and meaning. And that's what I, that's all that I did for you is I just asked pretty basic questions. I tried to bring them up on the Bloom's taxonomy asking you to apply to your teaching, um, which gets harder because you have to think differently. So no, I think the more questions you can keep throwing at people, the better. And then maybe say, okay, on your phone, even though it's a distractor, I'm going to tell you how to make it a non-distractor. I want you to look up this information. The first one to get it, here's a Hershey kiss, or, you know, sometimes you have to make it a little fun. But, or you guys look up this information. I'm from New York, so sorry about the guys and gals. You folks look up this, and you folks look up this, and then let's come together and put that information together. Sometimes it's just faster that you tell them what's missing. So you can call that just-in-time teaching. Find out what they already know and don't teach what they know. Often we do that. Go for where's the blank, where are the holes? And you can only find the holes if you ask questions. So sometimes I will start presentations with a series of questions, um, seeing where the audience lays, and then take it from there. That's often harder for jun more junior people because they're not as comfortable in the facility of their knowledge base yet. Any other questions? So there's, there's more information available today. How do you get your opinion? How does that affect the problem? 
um, if people are allowed and helped. So in the medical school, one of the um, accreditation standards for the LCME is actually self-directed learning activities, and they're very specific in what they have to do. The, the teacher in the classroom, they have to look up information and justify why it's a good source. They don't have to justify the information that they get, per se. So the activity is trying to learn, teach the trainee how to ask good questions, what are you missing in your brain, and then how do you find a good, re trustable resource to answer that question. And I think if we go in that direction, helping people figure out what you don't know. How do you know what you don't know unless until you start applying it? If we answer all the questions for people, then they never get a chance to practice that skill. So I think we're practicing different mental skills now. Figuring out, give them a case and say, okay, what do you don't know about this? What do you have to look up? And then giving them the space to look it up without shaming them, without saying, what do you mean you don't know that? I mean, I hope your culture isn't like that, but that's certainly, I read in the literature that that still appears to be a problem. Rather, applaud them for that's a great question. How will you find the answer to that? And then help them find the answer. So help them figure out what are good questions. I ran a molecular genetics course, and I wanted to give grades based on how much people learned and retained versus what their absolute learning was. So I wanted to give an A to a student who came in here and moved to here, and I wanted to give a C to someone who came in here and moved up here, or maybe came here and just moved this much. So the absolute material might have been the same, but this one didn't move very much. So I don't like those bars often. I really appreciate this person worked hard to change what they knew and how they knew it. So, and I, one of the things I had them do is read journal articles and just write down two questions they had. And it was amazing for some trainees, for some of those students, the questions at the beginning were the same at the end. What does this word mean? Others were, how can they possibly make conclusions about a human disease when they're studying uh, a cow gene put in a frog for transgenic frogs? That's a great question. What does transgenic frog mean is a terrible question. Maybe at the beginning it's good, but by the end that's not a... So you see what I'm saying? Help them to ask good questions, and you can model that in your Socratic method, and help them to find resources that will answer that in a good way. So I think that we have a huge opportunity if we can shift how we think about what teaching should look like. What do the trainees think about that? Anyone feel? I love asking. That's why I loved Andrew as a story. We often don't ask our trainees, how are you learning? What's difficult? What do you, how or what do you want us to work with you? And I think that that's a really valuable source of information. I bet you all don't learn the same way I do, so. We should be working towards you. Any other questions? Okay, it's eight. Go ahead. It's eight thirty-one. If anyone has to leave, I'm not insulted. So yes, so we're talking about how do you use the online learning systems to help people learn. Does that include videos or just material put up online? Or is so videos should not just be a PowerPoint or a lecture redux. Everything shows it's better if you help trainees apply the information. So even in a video, you might start with, this is the learning objectives of what I want you to take away from this. And then if you go back to mine, you know, I went through the pathway and then I helped you apply information. I helped you say what was something that was novel. So hopefully I gave you an activity that met every learning objective. So definitely embed questions in that. You know, say, look at this, do this, read this much or watch this much of a video, now solve this case. And if you look at technology videos, so whenever I get new video technology, I go online, they're like five minutes. And then it says, when you're ready for the next step, go to the next video. So then I'll play with what they told me to do. And if you think of working memory being, my magic number is three. 
I don't want you to remember th more than three things from my lecture. I'd like you to apply that. And if you have, I feel like I have hit a home run. If you do one, that's great. If you do zero, um, you know, I didn't do what, I didn't achieve what I wanted to do. But three to me is kind of this magic number. We usually can work with three things at a time. We can change three things about ourselves. If you start working with 10 pieces of information, you know, have you ever tried to change your behavior? It's hard if you do, you always say do one thing at a time. Change your eating. We never say, oh well, ditch all the fats, ditch all the bread, ditch all of this, um, because people can't do that. That's hard work in addition to the whole meant the taste thing. It's just physically hard. I have to clean out my whole kitchen. I don't have time for that, but I can buy one different milk. And then I can train myself. Then I can go in a month and add two new vegetables to my diet. That's easy to do. So I would think that same way. You're trying to change behavior, trying to th teach, change thoughts. So in any given period of time, one to three things. Get them to use that well, then move to the next. And then slowly make it more complex. I also had, when I taught an immunology course, um, I, students complained that it was too hard. And I said, well, I said, what it all depends on how I test you. So I can give similar information. It's how I want them to recall it back to me that's important. So if it's a medical student, their task may be just to learn what a bunch of words mean. The intern, now I need them to apply those words to a history and physical. The first year resident, this, or the PL2, that take that same information, and now I want them to be able to have a great conversation with the parent and work out a treatment plan. Same content but I'm asking them to apply it differently. So when you're working in groups, that could very well be how it is. You just say, this is the goals, the learning goals for this group, this is learning goals for this group, this is learning goals for that group. If they get other stuff, that's fabulous, but this is what you're gonna be tested on, you have to be very clear about that. Or this is my expectation for your recall. Anything else? Okay, well thanks, have a great day everyone.